I'm Phil DeMartin Pray, one of the pastors on staff here, if you happen to be a visitor. And I have three sons. Uh, my oldest son, Levi, is nine. My middle son, Judah, is seven. And my youngest son, Jonah, is four. And we're in the heart of baseball season right now. So I was down at the baseball field yesterday. They're all playing, luckily, on all three different teams at three different times. So I was down at the baseball field from about 7.30 to about 4.30 yesterday, which is a long time. But I love baseball. Or at least that's what I keep telling myself. <laughs> but when my wife first became pregnant, we'd been married a year, and she became pregnant with our oldest son, Levi, and we had no idea what to expect. Uh, there's that book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. We didn't read that, so that didn't help us. But you just don't know what to expect, and then the due date comes, and it's really kind of this nebulous date. They like take measurement. You know, many of you have had kids, or you've been through the process. And they give you this due date, and that's approaching, and you're not sure what's going to happen. And then for our first son, that due date came, which I believe it was October 11th was going to be his due date. And then, so then you go on baby watch, right? I mean, it kind of starts, for me, it kind of starts before that, where I'm basically useless at work, so sorry for that. Where it's like any buzz of the phone, anything, it's like, oh my goodness, is this my wife? No, you know, whatever. And then it's, the due date comes. And then it's the next day, and you're waiting, and then it's the next day, and you go to your doctor, like, okay, the due date, I thought it was supposed to be on the due date, isn't that why? It's due today. And then, so with our oldest son, we ended up going a week beyond the due date, and then having to induce uh, the pregnancy to deliver our oldest son, Levi. Fast forward two years after that, same, same situation with Judah. Judah's, uh, my wife is pregnant with our second son, Judah. Two years later... The due date this time is going to be October 22nd, and so my oldest son Levi is born October 18th, so, oh, maybe they'll be born on the same day, but they aren't. Goes forward, the due date comes, and then we wait, go on baby watch. Once again, a week later, the doctor says, hey, we should probably induce because it doesn't look like this baby's going to come out on its own right away. So we go a week late, and so my oldest son, or my middle son Judah is born October 29th through this induction process, and my wife becomes pregnant again three years later and with my youngest son Jonah. And so at this point, we kind of, we find out it's a boy again. We're like, okay, this is boys, this is how boys work. They just hang out longer in comfort. They're lazy. They don't really want to come out and do anything. And so we get a due date of November 7th, I think. November 7th or November 8th. And so... On October 30th, we're just playing it cool. We're not even near the due date yet. And my wife wakes up in the middle of the night, and she's like, I don't know, I think I have like some Braxton Hicks happening. And it's like 2 in the morning. And she's like, but we're not even near the due date, and we're going to go a week late, and we're going to be induced again. Like, this is the way this goes down. Fast forward uh, about 10 minutes later, (laughs) and these these Braxton Hicks are really close together. And I go, honey, I think you should call the doctor now. Because it's we don't deliver in Ramona, right? We deliver in Poway. Hopefully, we deliver in Poway. And so she calls the doctor, and he's like, yeah, those aren't Braxton Hicks. You need to go to the doctor's office right now. They're about two minutes apart at this point. So I, I'm, I'm panicked because this is not what I expected. I load, you know, blankets in the back of the car and some scissors. (laughs) You laugh now, but it wasn't funny. And we get to, I'm flying, I'm in a little, you know, Toyota Sienna minivan slash, you know, Formula One car. And I hit the turn to Poway, and we're flying down, and she's gripping the handle, like, we're not going to make it, and it's just flying, I'm like, this is not happening, this is not happening, we get there, they don't let you know in advance, or maybe they do, and I didn't pay attention, that when you show up at uh, Palmer Auto, between the hours of like 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., you don't go through the regular OB door, you go through the ER door, so we're, I like, get her to that door, and it's like, closed, go to the ER, like, what? So finally get her in. We fast forward about an hour and we're holding our baby Jonah. I mean, it was crazy fast. They didn't, they they want to hook you up and check your, no hookups, no nothing. 
get to a room, get on a bed. So these, we didn't have, our doctor wasn't there. They called, they woke up some doctor on the floor who stumbled in and stood in the doorway and had no interest in delivering a baby. I don't think he was an OB. He's like, yeah, we'll just wait for your doctor. He'll be here soon. And the nurse is like, no, the baby's here now. We'll just come and grab this thing. <laughs> but this baby was not a week late. It was a week early. He managed, this is our son Jonah, managed to slip in October. So all our sons are in October. It wasn't a week late. Uh, we weren't induced. We didn't have a doctor present. We didn't have all the hookups. This thing was so different than what we expected because we had set this pattern. Okay, this is how we have kids, especially when they're boys. If it's a girl, maybe it'd be different, but this is the pattern for our children. As we think about this morning expectations, expectations are powerful things. I mean, we only had two kids. It wasn't like we had 12 kids and they were all a week late. We had this building expectation. We just had two, but we had an expectation. It's a boy. We're going to go a week late. And so when everything started getting ripped off, we had no idea what was going on. What we'll see in, in our expectation wasn't super well built. It wasn't some deep level expectation. But when we come to the gospel of Luke and the story of Jesus, there are deep expectations of who this king's going to be and how this birth is going to go down for this king. This Messiah that's coming, that's been prophesied for thousands of years through the Old Testament. I mean, the, the Jews are waiting and they have, they have an expectation as to who this king is, how he's going to come and what he's going to do. And what we'll see this morning is that rather than being born in pomp and circumstances and celebration and notoriety, we have this king come in absolute obscurity. Nobody's there. Nobody knows. Turn with me in your scriptures to Luke chapter 1, or chapter 2, excuse me. Luke chapter 2. We'll pick up in verse 1, and we'll see right away that this doesn't go quite as expected. We'll read the whole passage, and then we'll come down and break it down. Luke chapter 2, the second gospel, uh, or the third gospel in your New Testament, as recorded by Luke. This is what it says, picking up in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled, filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom with he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherd told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in their heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it has been told them. This is the, this is the moment. This is the moment that all history has been waiting for. This is the moment as we've begun this journey in our series of Yeshua. This is the moment. The king is born. 
And if we look at the first part, it begins like you would expect it to begin. It talks about this this registration that was called out by Caesar. Hey, you have to go to your hometown to be registered. And you think, oh, why is that important? Well, it's important because in Micah chapter 5, there's a prophecy regarding the Messiah that he's going to come from Bethlehem. And so we see Mary and Joseph, who we're familiar with already in the story, they have to move, they have to go and travel this about 100 miles, nine months pregnant, about to give birth to a baby. They have to travel this great distance to go to the city of Bethlehem, the small little city, to, for, for this registration. And so we see, oh, this is how, this is how God is moving his Messiah to be born in Bethlehem. There's no palace in Bethlehem, but we, we're, we're tracking. And then even in those first couple verses, Luke makes a point to say twice, mention twice, the city of David, because Joseph is a son, he's a, of the line of David, right? Reiterating this idea, oh, right, right, this is the Messiah. This is David's descendant. This is the king of the Jews. This is a king from the line of David. It makes a point. So it's just captured. We're moving. We're going, okay, the king is coming. The king is coming. And it's kind of like this big balloon inflating. And then in just one verse, it kind of pricks the bottom of the balloon. And it slowly starts to deflate. The expectations just turn into questions. The king is here, but what is this? This isn't just any king, right? This is the Messiah, the anointed one. Now, if we think what we looked at before in Luke just a couple weeks ago. Let's think of John the Baptizer's birth narrative for just a second. I think it will help. Luke is intentional to inflate the expectation and then to deflate it right in front of us. But when we think about the birth of John, what do we have? Let's just try and remember. There's a sign and a prophecy, and it comes through an angel in the temple. The temple is the center of the Jewish religious life. The temple is everything. That's where you go to worship God. That's where God meets with his people. This building, this picture of where God is able to interact with his people, with priests. And the the angel comes to a priest, this well-respected, honored priest. And he says, to him, your wife will be with son, and you will name him John. There's a prophecy there. To this priest, the baby's going to be born in the temple. And then when the time comes, the baby's born. And then what do we see right after that? We see miracles right we see Zechariah's muteness and his deafness lifted we see the birth of this baby we see crowds there we see people they're arguing over what the name's going to be right is it going to be are you going to name him Zechariah no we're going to name him John what John there's this this huge crowd and then and then Zechariah goes on to prophesy and he says his name is John he writes it down and then he's lifted his muteness is lifted and, and it says everybody who saw these things were amazed and they wondered and it went, throughout the, it went throughout the Judean countryside that, man, this baby, there's something special about this baby. That's the question that Luke give, gives us in verse 66 of chapter 1. It says, and all who heard them laid up in their hearts, who heard this story of John the baptizer, who heard the story of the angel and Zechariah and Elizabeth. And this is the question. They were saying, what then will this child be? There's something special about this child. This crowd that's there and this news that spreads across the countryside. Everybody's hearing about this. So that's our expectation for John. And John, even as as, uh, Tracy read the passage this morning, John is the one who says of Jesus, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. He is greater than me because he came before I came. He was before I was. And so if we think of, man, look at this beautiful, incredible picture of crowds and news and proclamations of John being born, we think, okay, well, what's going to happen when the actual king comes? I mean, this guy's just the one who goes before the king. What will the picture of the king be? Palaces and handmaids and trumpets and this huge proclamation that the king of the Jews is here. No, that's not it. One verse, look with me in Luke 2, 7. It all culminates, verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. This is it. This is the king is coming. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. What? 
What does these one sentence? She wraps him in cloths and puts him in this stone trough used to feed animals because they're out in a cave because there's no place for them to stay inside. There's no room for them in the inn or in the, there's no guest house for them to stay in. This is the king. There's nobody here. There's no family here. There's no friends here. There's no one celebrating. There's no one ringing trumpets or ringing bells or celebrating the birth of the king. There's two common Jews in a cave, in a stable, potentially with animals because there was no place to put them. And whether the whole city was packed out or, or places they could stay didn't really want to because there were big rooms they'd put a lot of people in. Maybe they didn't want to put Mary and Joseph in because they knew she's going to have a baby. I mean, she's looking ready to have a baby. They don't want that happening, you know, in a room full of people. There's all kinds of Jewish ceremonial cleanliness laws. So they don't have a place to stay. This is the birth of the king. The Davidic king who, who, who history through the Old Testament has cried out for before. Who Mary would have known these expectations. Man, this is the king that's going to set us free. These are unusual beginnings, without a doubt. And so our expectation just begins to shrink down. And as Luke continues to tell the story, it just shrinks down even further. Because then what happens? Finally, finally we get something that's kind of special, right? Angel, an angel comes. And the glory of the Lord comes. Now this is it. But who does he come to? Read with me. Yeah, he comes to shepherds. To shepherds, not to kings, not to priests, not to Jewish religious leaders, not to Roman officials and rulers. He comes to shepherds. Look in verse 8. Somewhere nearby where this birth just took place on a hillside, there's a handful of grubby shepherds out taking care of their sheep, sleeping on a hillside, and they're taking turns staying awake so the wolves and bears don't come and eat their sheep. These are not people through whom God is going to bring his message. Is it? Verse 8. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Interesting that Luke makes this point to mention that the glory of the Lord comes. So ripping through the darkness of night comes an angel with the glory of the Lord that illuminates this hillside. Everybody's wide awake and terrified. What is going on? It's to these lowly, humble shepherds. Now, shepherds weren't necessarily hated, but they weren't really valuable people. They served a purpose. They were with sheep. They took care of sheep. Our minds immediately go back. We're in the city of David. We're talking about shepherds. Our mind goes back to another time where there was a shepherd involved who was of humble origin and a young boy, and we think of David, the shepherd. But here it seems like Luke's point is these are just kind of low, humble, obscure people to match with a low, humble, obscure birth. But yet this is where the glory of the Lord comes. And this is the glory that hasn't even been on earth anywhere in over 600 years. Since Israel had turned their hearts from God and God left the temple. The glory of the Lord left the temple. And it hasn't been back. They've been waiting for it to come back. Ezekiel promised it would come back. And who's it come back to? Where's it come back? It comes back to these shepherds on a hillside with sheep. And it comes back with a message. The angel of the Lord appears to them in verse 10. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It's those three terms, Savior, that Savior, or Rescuer, or Deliverer, who is Christ. And the word Christ is what? What, is, what does Christos mean in the Greek? Messiah. That's the Messiah, the Anointed One. So He's the Savior, He's the Anointed One, and He's the Lord. These are three huge terms for this baby that, he, that the angel of the Lord reveals to these shepherds. The Savior, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Promised One, the Lord is here. He is born. And He's born, and this is how you'll know it's Him. Verse 12, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And so the shepherds are just the first-hand experience. There's no crowd. There's no announcement. There's, it's to the shepherds. While they're taking care of their sheep, an angel comes, and the glory of the Lord comes. And they say, you'll find this baby. You'll find this deliver Messiah, Lord, wrapped in these common cloths, lying in this stone trough that would normally feed animals. That's where you'll find the king. And the shepherds, I love the shepherds' response to these angels. They're like, all right, rad, let's go find him. They look to each other and they say, hey, let's go find out what the angels said. And so they do. This is an unusual audience for the king's messengers, but they listen to his message. They believe his message. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds say to one another, let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord himself has made known to us. They recognize the divine nature of these angelic messengers, the message they have brought. And it's interesting because the question we would ask ourselves is, is why shepherds? And we'll get to part of that in the end, but also one reason the shepherds would have known exactly where these stables are. There's a baby born in a stable. Who better to know and be the first witnesses than people who work in stables? Than people who know where these stables are? They go, oh, we know where the stables are in Bethlehem. And there aren't normally babies in there. But we'll find one wrapped in swaddling cloths because we believe this angelic message. And then we'll see some different responses to the king and to the messengers. So in verse 16, And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that has been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Just picture this meeting for just a second. There's so much in between just the words here. And this is one of the reasons why at the end of John's gospel, he says, man, if we wrote everything down, there wouldn't be libraries to contain it all of the things that just even Jesus said and did. But you just imagine this picture, Mary, who's, who has her own expectations of the Messiah, who the Messiah will be, he's going to be the king. She knows she's, she's confident, she believes that the son she's bearing is from the Lord. She knows she's a virgin. She's not even fulfilled, her, her and Joseph haven't fulfilled the marriage ceremony yet. She's still just betrothed. They've trekked a hundred miles away from her home, from her family. And that's where they're going to have this baby. And then they're just there by themselves. There's no witnesses. There's no family. There's no celebration. There's no discussion of what the name's going to be. It's just a little baby crying. Put him in a trough. Just the two of them. Until they hear this just kind of scuffling sounds. And in come a bunch of grubby little shepherds. Be like, what are you guys doing in here? They're like, hey, is there a baby in here? Because we saw an angel, and an angel told us there would be a baby in here. An angel, an angel told us that we are to look for your baby, because he is the rescuer. He's the Savior, he's the Messiah, he's the Lord. And you can just imagine that first exchange. As they talked with Mary as to who this baby is, and she relayed to, him certain, to them certain things, and they're relaying to her and Joseph the story of the angels. And we saw the glory of the Lord in the heavenly host, and they're singing, Glory to God in the highest. Or they're saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among men with whom he is pleased. See, the glory of the Lord now is on earth. And this baby is going to bring peace between men and God. This is crazy. And so they have this experience with Mary. And then they go out and it refers to all those who heard. So they're telling people or explain. And it says they they return. They return back to their sheep. But while they're going through Bethlehem. They're just talking about what God has done. They're talking about the messages of God, the truth of God, the promises of God, the fulfillment of this baby. And so in them we see what I I kind of picture is just kind of this childish belief and hope. And like a kid who they know on Christmas Day they're going to get presents. So Christmas Eve they're just pumped. They're just so excited. These shepherds, they're not educated people. 
But they saw and they believed and they heard and they believed and they're going throughout and they're sharing the truth of what they believe and they just believe and celebrate. And it says that all those who heard wondered at these things, were amazed, marveled. It doesn't mean they believed. It just means that those who heard this story are marveling. This is an amazing story. The things the shepherds are telling us. This is incredible. If this is true, this is something different. But They marveled at it. And so we see the shepherds' response in just pure, unbridled belief and joy. And we see the crowd's response, the people that hear, is marveling. They see, or they're hearing of a mighty work of God. And they're astounded by it. We don't know if they believe or not, but they're astounded by it. This is incredible. This is an incredible story. And then we have Mary's response. And this is a response we're going to see again later as she thinks about who her son is. Because for Mary, she's been carrying this baby for nine, ten months. So she's had a lot of time to think about this. Think about her baby, the Messiah, and think about, spend extra time reading about the Messiah, this king who's going to come and deliver his people. And read with me what she, how she responds in verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. It's this collection. The idea that Luke has explained to us is she's kind of collecting, compiling her memories of this baby. And she's going over them and she's thinking. Now she's including the shepherds and this divine message and even the divine glory of God. And she's pondering. She's, mul- she's mulling them over. The idea is she's trying to put the pieces together. She's just engaged fully in her mind and intellect. Okay, what is God doing Certainly Mary would not have expected this of her own birth, much less the Messiah's birth. To have, to have her soon-to-be husband called to go 100 miles away, to travel with him, they're not, they're not officially married yet. To be tucked away in a cave, this isn't, this isn't no, no religious rabbis, no one's taught her that this is how the Messiah is going to come. She, she would have known that coming in Bethlehem, sure, but certainly not like this. And so the, the picture is that she, she treasures these things. She's collecting these stories and these memories, and she's going over them again and again and pondering, trying to piece them together. And I think she has her own expectations of what God is going to do, and then she has what's happening, and those aren't matching. I think that's one of the things as we look at this passage that can stand true for us. And this is a truth throughout human history is that God isn't following human plans and human expectations. God is doing what God will do. And God gives promises. God gives promises, and then sometimes we take those promises, I think, and we fill them with our own expectations. And we say, well, if God is going to do this, if God's going to bring a king, it's going to be like this. God says, no, I'll bring a king, but I'm going to do it my way. My way's different than your way. We see this in our own lives. Sometimes we think of, of what God is doing around us and it's not what we expect. Sometimes there's a thought in Christianity that once we come to Christ, then our lives should be easier. And we wouldn't say it, but sometimes we think it. I shouldn't be dealing with this sickness. I shouldn't have this tragedy happen to me. I shouldn't have this financial burden heaved on me. I'm a, I'm a son of the king, I thought. He was going to provide and protect me. God might be doing something totally different. I think of of marriage and how we think about marriage and what God intended marriage to be. There's a book that I um, recommend. It's a marriage book. It's called Sacred Marriage. But the premise of the book is that God didn't intend marriage for our happiness, but for our holiness was that the heart of marriage isn't just to make each other happy, but it's to make us more like Christ, to make us more like who God would want us to be. But sometimes we enter, oftentimes we enter marriage expecting the other person is just going to make us the happiest person in the world. And then when you get two people thinking the other person's going to make them the happiest in the world, I mean, you know where that ends. But that that's not what God intended marriage to be, but we fill up, because marriage is good, God intended marriage to be good. 
and then we fill up what good means with our own expectation. Now, that's not God's expectation. He doesn't follow our plans. Another thing that stands out, and as we look at the birth of Jesus, I mean, it's not Christmas, but we can celebrate the birth of Jesus at any time. And I think it's interesting that Luke starts out the passage. He takes one of the highest rulers in all the world at that point, Caesar, and he says, Caesar made a decree that went out for all of mankind, for the whole world, in verse 1 of chapter 2. A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This place of authority that Caesar has. Hey, everybody, all the world be registered. And we see this picked back up, this idea of all the world coming through the angels to the shepherds. They say, we bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, that will be for all the world. We have a message from the true ruler of all things that is for all people. And that is Jews, that is Gentiles, that is all the people of the earth. That this baby is the deliverer, and he's the promised one, and he is Lord. And he, we see even here, Luke shows us that even as a baby, Jesus is changing lives. He changes the lives of the shepherds. When they come and see him, they leave praising and glorifying God. As people hear that, they begin to hear these stories, and as we're going to see this happening through the Gospels. Jesus is changing lives. He's changing the way people think about the world. And he's doing that today. He's done that in our lives. He's done that in my life, in all of your lives, in different ways. And his plan for that is different than anyone would have expected. You see, the world, and even the way we work in the world, is that you do certain things and you earn certain things. That's how we work with our kids. That's how we work with our, uh, and oftentimes in our marriages, in our workplaces, that if we perform to a certain level, we can expect to receive certain things. That is the way of the world. And most, almost every religious system is, fo- is formed around that idea. That through behavior, you can make yourself, if they have an idea of God or heaven, if you're good enough, or if you follow the law enough, you can make yourself right with God. God will be pleased with you. You will receive heaven. That's not the, what God decided to do. Because God knew that system doesn't work. But that through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith, that's what we do. We believe. We don't, we don't seek to follow all his laws to make ourselves right with him. We believe to begin our relationship with Jesus. And that is how he rescues us. That's how the Messiah rescues us. And then sets himself up as the Lord of our life. And in our grateful response to him, we seek to obey him. We don't obey him so we're right with God. We obey him because we are right with God through faith. Uh, One last closing thought, and it kind of came through um, one of the songs, and as Tracy shared, uh, the passage from John, is that God, in this picture of these, in this dark, uh, Luke makes a point to say, that they're, they're protecting their flock by night. It's night. And it's fitting that God chose darkness to bring light into. That as we sang uh, that uh, Phil Wickham song, Out of the darkness, um, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. And that here in the darkness is where Jesus comes to bring light. And in light, things are illuminated and can set us free. In darkness, you cannot see. But when the angels come, this light that comes, that came to the world in Jesus, it came to set us free. And it's because of his glory and it's because of his plan that goes against anything that anyone would expect. And we will see that pattern carry on as we continue to follow the story of Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we are amazed at your plan, your rescue plan, to come to the world you created in humility and obscurity. None of us would choose that for even our own birth or the birth of any of our children. And yet that is what you chose for the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. God, we're humbled by that. Teach us 
Uh, we see that you use humble and obscure things and people to bring about your truth into the world. Help us to be humble and obscure when needed. Thank you for being our rescuer, our deliverer, and our Lord. Help us in our weakness to submit to your Lordship. It's by grace we're made right with you. Help us to come under your Lordship, to come under the authority of your word and of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we would live lives for you wherever we are. For that's the place of good news and great joy for us and for all around us. It's in your precious name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.